The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 47 million Americans who benefit from group insurance? Listen carefully to this special message from Mr. Eugene Holman, president of the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. Mr. Holman says, and I quote, we believe in maintaining contributory benefit programs in cooperation with our employees. These programs enable them to achieve economic security over and above what they obtain from their pay envelopes. In carrying out these programs, we have found group life insurance and group annuities very helpful. Yes, group insurance is something worth owning. In 14 minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will give further important information about group insurance which will interest both employers and employees. Tonight's FBI file, The Return of the Killer. Many of the axioms we learned as children have the deep wisdom of eternal truth. Mottos like a stitch in time saves nine or a word to the wise is sufficient. But there are some catchphrases that we still repeat that bear not one whit of truth. A catchphrase like the one which goes, there is honor among thieves. There is no honor, no loyalty among criminals. For honor and loyalty are qualities which the criminal mind does not quite grasp. Honor and loyalty, you understand, do not show any immediate profit. And the criminal, greedy and hate-filled, regards his fellow men in one of two ways. To the criminal, you, the stranger, are either a potential partner in crime, or you are a potential victim. Tonight's file opens in the dreary prison cell occupied by Chicago Thompson and Frank Patterson. It is late evening and the lights have just been turned out. In the dismal semi-darkness, Frank breaks the silence. Well, I think I'll go to sleep, Chicago. Not so quick. Huh? It's three to go, ain't it? Less than that. How do you figure? Oh, this is Friday night. I get out Monday morning. That's two days, ain't it? Why don't you learn how to count? What do you mean? Today's Friday, tomorrow's Saturday, the next day's Sunday. I got two more days to go. Look, after you've been in stir as many times as I have, you'll learn how to count time. How do you do it? The way I figure, you got three nights. Tonight, Saturday night, Sunday night. That's right, but it's only two days. Who cares about the days? They don't make stir tough. It's the nights. Yeah, you sure got that right. I never miss the big town during the day. Why should you? You was probably sleeping all day. Yeah, I was. But at night, I was the head man at night. I used to go to a joint called the Moonbeam Club every night with my girl. What's her name again? Martha Bentley. And you remember where she lives, don't you? Yeah, sure. She lives at the hotel bar. That's right. Apartment 415. I can remember that. You better be able to. I will, I will. Now, let's get some sleep. Why? You got a big day tomorrow? No, but I'm tired. I've been in that bakery since 7 o'clock this morning. You've been in the bakery ever since you got in this jug? Yeah. It's like the Army. What do you mean, like the Army? Now, you know that paper they ask you to fill out when you come in? Sure, I know. But one of them questions was, name your favorite hobby. I remember. So I thought I'd be a wise guy, and I answered counting dough, so they stuck me in a bakery. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, big joke. 
Well, starting Monday, you don't have to make bread anymore. In fact, starting Monday, you don't even have to eat it. It's all right with me if I don't even have to see it. Now, is it all right if I go to sleep? Okay. Hey, Frank. What do you want now? You remember what you got to tell Miss Bentley? Yeah, yeah. I tell her that Monday night she should open a safe deposit box. That's right. You remember the rest of it? Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. I'll be there. Okay. Now you can go to sleep. Thanks. Hello, Martha. Well, where have you been, now, buddy? Take it easy, kid. You don't have to yell. I'm right here. Well, where have you been all day? I've been out collecting some money for it. Is that all right? Listen, a guy named Frank Patterson came to see me this morning. Who's Frank Patterson? He was in the can with Chicago in the same cell. Oh, yeah? He picked up two of Chicago's guns, and he brought me a message. Chicago said for me to open the safe deposit box Monday night. What safe deposit box? That was a code Chicago and I had. It means that he's breaking out of that joint tonight. What? That's right. He's being sprung tonight. What time? Patterson was supposed to meet him at Maywood Junction at 10 o'clock, inside the main entrance to the cemetery. 10 o'clock? Five minutes to 10 now. Well, I've been trying to get you all day. Well, it's too late to call a warden. What'd you say? I said it's too late to call a warden. Trying to figure some way to stop Chicago. If he comes back here and finds out you're not his girl anymore, he's liable to use one of those guns. Yeah. When he finds out that I'm your girl, he'll make it a double header. You say Patterson was going to pick him up at 10 o'clock inside the cemetery entrance at Maywood Junction? Yeah, that's right. Okay. We might be able to catch them yet. Hello, operator. I want Maywood Junction, the police station. You, Chicago? Yeah, yeah. Where's the car? Follow me. Okay, Chicago, here we are. I'll get in first. Did you bring the guns? Yeah, here's your 45. Machine guns on the back seat. Okay, let's get rolling. Uh, before we start, where are we going? Let's get to a telephone. I want to call Martha. Ain't that a little dangerous? Martha knows the coppers might be tapping the phone. She won't call me by my right name. Oh. Where do we go after the phone call? That depends on what she says. Okay. Thanks for planting that suit of clothes for me, Frank. Oh, that's okay. Hope I can return the favor someday. Hey, what the... Faster, Frank. Steady now. I'm going to try to stop him. Well, I got the cop that was driving. What happened to him? Sounded like they hit something. They did. They hit another car, the one that passed us going the other way. Both of them turned over. Whew. I'd just as soon not come that close again. Don't worry about a thing, Frank. Not while I got little Betsy here and some bullets. I love to kill cops. Hey, Chicago. Come on. Then them cops didn't ask no questions. They just started shooting. You suppose they knew it was us coming out of the cemetery? I don't know, but I'd sure love to find out. In a nearby city, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk in the field office of your FBI. Special Agent Dave Johnson, who has just been assigned to work with Taylor, is entering Jim's office. Oh, hello, Dave. Hi, Jim. Boss just called and told me we were working together. Yes. Do you have any dope on the case? Yes, it's right here. Chicago Thompson escaped from the state penitentiary an hour ago. Oh? We've had a detainer against him for years. How'd he get out? Any dope on that? We're not sure. But the only vehicle that went out of the prison last night between 8 o'clock when Thompson was last seen in his cell and 10 o'clock when the police got a tip that he'd escaped was a garbage truck. He got out in that, huh? Looks like it. Either in a barrel or hanging on the bottom of the truck. You say a tip came in that he escaped? That's right. About 9.55, the Maywood Junction police got a call telling them that Thompson had escaped and that he was going to meet a man named Frank Patterson at the Maywood Cemetery gate at 10. Well, that didn't give him much time to work. No, it didn't. They sent the only two men who were on duty out in a squad car. They missed him, huh? No. Thompson had a submachine gun. He shot the officer who was driving the squad car, and the car crashed. Thompson got away. What happened to the other officer? I was over at the hospital to see him. You got anything? Yes. Patterson was driving a black Buick convertible, license plates 9J5347. Who are those plates assigned to? I don't know yet. I've got an alarm out on the car, and I've got the license bureau checking the plates. We should be hearing from them any minute. Oh, 
Well, baby, it's ten after eleven. Feel better now than you did an hour ago. You bet, sugar. Then I always feel good with you. <sighs> Me too, honey. Chicago ought to be getting back into itself just about now. Yeah, I guess just about now. Probably wondering how the cops knew about the cemetery. Well, he'll never suspect it was his trusted lieutenant. And his ex-girl. You can cut yourself in for half of this. Martha, I was just thinking. Mm, we get into trouble every time you do that. No, honey, I'm serious. <laughs> What's on your mind? Why don't we go out, pick up a couple of bottles of champagne, and come back here and celebrate? Okay. I'll tell you what. Hello? Hello, Martha. Chicago. Hello, Morton. Gee, baby, I've missed you. Oh, I've missed you, too, Morton. It's always half past lonesome without you. Uh, where are you? Uh, I'm out on Route 30, about 15 miles from town. I'm in a restaurant with Frank. You want me to come out there? No, no, I don't want to stay here too long. Where can I meet you? At the cabin near Oak Park. I'll be there in about two hours. Okay, honey, I'll be there. That was Chicago. I know, what did he say? Wants to meet me. Where? The cabin near Oak Park. The address there is 97 Oak Park Lane, isn't it? Yeah. Cheer up, honey. Buddy, he'll murder both of us. He ain't gonna murder nobody. I'm gonna make another phone call, and don't worry, those coppers ain't gonna miss this time. Yes, I see. Well, thanks for your help. Goodbye. Well, Dave, that takes care of the license plates. Who was that? That was the license bureau. The plates were issued to a man named Ralph Jenkins, a legitimate citizen. He's a grocer, and he owns a Pontiac. But the getaway car was a Buick. That's right. They must have been using doctored license plates. Not too tough to change some of those numbers. No, it's not. Dave, let's get a list of Thompson's old mob, and just start checking it off from the top on down. You think you'd head for one of them for cover, huh? Well, wouldn't that be your guess? Huh? As logical as any. I'll tell you what, Jim. Suppose I go to work on the piles right now and get up that list of Thompson's mob. That's a good idea. And we'll split them up, each take half and... Special Agent Taylor. Oh, hello, Chief. What's up? You did? Will, will you give me that address again, please? 97 Oak Park Lane. Right? Okay, Chief, we'll meet you there. We're on our way now. Sit down for a couple of minutes, honey, while I get some glasses. Then we can start some serious drinking. Okay, I guess they must have picked up Chicago by now. Oh, sure. Like I said, the cops ain't gonna miss two shots at them. Uh, hey, when we finish these two bottles, let's go out somewhere, huh? Why not? It's a special occasion. What about the Moonbeam Club? Yeah, yeah, let's go there. You kind of make the whole thing seem real. What do you mean? The last time I was at the Moonbeam was with Chicago. Oh, uh -huh. It's my birthday. We really got mauled. <laughs> now I'm... I'm going there with you. Ain't it too bad what? you ain't gonna have any more birthdays. Chicago, where have you been? I've been in the bedroom listening. Oh, what a nice pair of double crosses you two are. Uh, Chicago, you got me all wrong. You I... move in on my rackets, you move in on my apartment, you move in on my girl. Chicago, Shut I was... Up. Chicago, what about the cabin? I was just... I sent Patterson to the cabin. I came in here to pick up the keys to my safe deposit boxes. I notice a lot of buddies' clothes. I decide to wait till you come in. Look, Chicago, I, I only told was... you to shut up. I called Patterson at the cabin. The cops were closing in on him out there. Too bad about you, too. Now you know what's going to happen, don't you? Chicago, put away that gun. Why? Because you forget that all those safe deposit boxes, the one in Cleveland and in Buffalo and the one in Detroit, they're all in my name. So what? So unless I sign my signature, you can throw those keys away. And I can't write my name if I'm dead. You don't want to throw all that money away, do you, Chicago? Okay, you can stay alive until I get the money. Look, Chicago, I never... Shut up. I told you to shut up twice and you didn't listen. Maybe this will shut you up. <sighs> well, there goes your boyfriend. Now, come on, let's get my money. <laughs> We will re-
return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes national security. Now let's hear from a typical American worker who has attained greater personal security thanks to his employer's cooperation and the Equitable Society. Believe me, Mr. Cross, I'm one guy who's mighty glad to work for a company where he gets complete group insurance protection. I'll bet you are. Nothing like getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and a retirement income, plus hospital, medical, and surgical benefits for yourself and your wife and children, all in one package from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And no medical examination either. Well, the thing that beats me is it all costs so little. How come? That's something that amazes everybody about group insurance. You see, when a group of employees buys insurance through their employer, they can get that insurance from the Equitable Society at what you might call wholesale cost. Then, too, the employer himself pays a part of the cost. You know, Mr. Cross, a fellow in my department, name of Jim Dolan, retired last year on his group annuity benefits plan. Every month, that old check comes in from the Equitable Society. Yes, sir, Jim and his family are set for life. And so will I be when I'm 65. You know, group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society in 1911. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Society, says, Group insurance is the most inspiring life insurance development of our time. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your company's group program is incomplete, your management can get in touch with the nearest Equitable Life Assurance Society office. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Return of the Killer. The criminal, to repeat an observation made earlier in the program, has no sense of honor or loyalty. But there is one quality which every criminal does possess, a quality without which it would be impossible for him to be a true criminal. That inevitable characteristic of everyone who makes a career of living beyond the law is ego. Without his delusions of bravery, of self-importance, and of grandeur, the criminal would be a cringing mediocrity. But with those delusions, he fancies that he can stand alone against the world and keep fighting the world until the world quits. What the criminal never learns is that decency never surrenders. The night file continues in the midtown apartment of Chicago Thompson, the apartment taken over by Buddy White. Now, Special Agents Jim Taylor and Dave Johnson are finished examining Buddy White's body. Well, I guess there isn't much else we can find out from the body. No, not until the lab gives us a report on the bullets that killed him. Yes, they might match some in the unidentified ammunition file. The elevator man was pretty sure of his identification, huh? Yes, especially when I showed him a picture of Chicago. But why didn't the elevator man notify the police when Chicago came in? Oh, he didn't know it was Chicago. He's only been working here a couple of months. Oh. How did Chicago get in the apartment? Well, they must have had a key. Remember, this was his apartment. Oh, that's right, so it was. Dave, what about the other man? The doorman? Mm Mm-hmm. He didn't know a thing, huh? No, he says he didn't see Chicago. He's been here long enough to know him. And he says he's positive that if Chicago was here, he came and went by the back entrance. Well, could be. Well, what do we do now, Jim? Well, let's move on to the next name on the list. Maybe Chicago will be calling on some more of his old friends. What time do you think we'll get to Cleveland? Oh, we're a good three hours away. That'll get us there about four in the morning. Yeah, about then. The banks don't open till nine. I can wait. So can you. Just keep driving. Don't try anything funny. What do you mean? I mean like stalling if we pass a cop. I used the gun oh, once tonight. don't worry. I'm not that silly. It's hard to tell about you. You got pretty silly with that buddy. You got sent away for 30 years. What did you want me to do? I just wanted you to remember you were my girl. 
But a girl's got to live, Chicago. 30 years is a long time. I told you I wasn't going to be gone no 30 years. Oh, I know. Forget it. It's over now. Chicago, I'll make a deal with you. No dice. Don't you want to hear my deal? No. You're not in any position to be making a deal. Just drive. Okay, dear. Cut it. Don't dare a honey me. You got a chance to live without that. I have? Yeah. After I get my dough out of that last box, I might let you go. I'm not sure yet. Maybe I'll let you go. Maybe I'll knock you off. We'll see. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, this is William Fremont. Oh, yes, Mr. Fremont. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I'm the doorman. The doorman at the Fayette Apartments. Oh, yes. Place where Chicago Thompson lived. Well, go on, Mr. Fremont. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I told one of your agents that I didn't see Chicago Thompson tonight. Yes, so I understand. Well, uh, I did. You did? When? He came out of the house about a half an hour before you arrived. Was he alone? Uh, no, sir. He was with his girl, Martha Bentley. They left in her car. What made you lie to Mr. Johnson before? Mr. Thompson gave me $50 as he was leaving, and he told me to say I didn't see him. Did you hear him say anything to Miss Bentley by any chance? Uh, no, sir. But he did ask me which was the best road to Cleveland. Cleveland? Huh? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Fremont. I'll see you later. Dave Thompson's on his way to Cleveland. He's driving there with Martha Bentley in her car that left about an hour and a half ago. We can beat them there if we fly. That's just what we're going to do. Look, I'm going in and see the boss. While I'm in there, find out from the license bureau what kind of a car Martha Bentley owned, what her license plate number is. Right. And then I'll put out an alarm on it. Right, and have them put roadblocks on three roads leading into Cleveland. Check. Oh, and one other thing, Dave. Call the Cleveland office. Ask them to have some men ready to give us a hand. And by the time you're through with that, I'll be finished with the boss. Then we can fly out of here. Sure got a lot of trees along this road, Chicago. Yeah. Guy could hide out in these woods for a month if he had it. You won't have to. No. Did you make up your mind yet about me? About knocking you off? Yeah. Just about. What'd you decide? I'll let you know later. When? After I get my hands on my dough. Hey, there's a cop in the road. Keep driving, no matter what he tries to do. Wait. No buts, keep driving. <laughs> Never even noticed it. Why should he? They're not looking for this car. Lucky you gave the doorman that 50. You can buy anybody with dough. You just gotta know their price. Some guys cost more than others, that's all. I'll say one thing for you. What's that? Being in the jug didn't change your bit. Why should it? I don't know. Some guys change, though. Only the phonies. They get weak. They get sorry for what they did. Weren't you ever sorry for anybody in your life? No. Only suckers get sorry for anybody. It only gets you into trouble. I see. You gotta be strong, sure of yourself. It's the only way to make good. Yeah, yeah. What are all those lights? Take it easy. They got the road blocked. What'll I do? Give it the gas. We drive right through. I got the machine gun ready. I got one, baby. Keep going. Chicago, I'm hit in the shoulder. Stop the car. Goodbye, baby. I'm headed for those trees. And just so you can't tell them which way I went... Chicago, not me! Taylor to roadblock three. Taylor to roadblock three. This is Richardson, Jim. Come in. Richardson, any sign of Thompson on your side of the woods? None at all. Okay, I'll check with you later. Over. I think I saw something moving there, Jim. Where? Right there. Get down, Dave! Dave, you all right? Yeah, yeah, just a little dirty. All right, Thompson. You're just making it tougher for yourself to get out alive. Now, come out with your hands up and nobody here will fire at you. You have no chance of escaping. The woods are completely surrounded. Come out with your hands. There he goes, Jim. Across the road over there. You got 
Adam, Jim. Yeah. I'm almost sorry. What? I'm almost sorry I killed him. That's one guy I wanted to see walk to the electric chair. I wanted to see how brave he was without that Tommy gun. He'd be like all the rest. I guess you're right. No gun, no guts. His accomplices dead, Frank Pedersen was tried and convicted of aiding a prisoner to escape and was sentenced to the penitentiary for a long term. Chicago Thompson had the mind of a criminal and the philosophy of a criminal. The philosophy that might makes right and that only the very strong deserve to survive. Chicago Thompson died. But his philosophy did not die with him. It is alive today in the heart and mind of every criminal. Between these criminals and you, the American people, stands every law enforcement office in the nation. Your local police, your state police, and your FBI. They shall continue to see to it that might does not make right, but only that right makes might. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word to business executives. Since group insurance was originated by the Equitable Life Assurance Society 35 years ago, thousands of employers have learned that group insurance means satisfied workers, builds loyalty and morale, decreases labor turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. Get all the facts and figures from an Equitable Society group insurance expert. Whether your employees are entirely uninsured or have only partial protection, get in touch with the nearest office or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Danger in the jury box. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Danger in the Jury Box, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.